That is correct. Yeah, that is a duty, perhaps, for many people. They feel obligated to help them return. Anyone else want to share? Johnny Depp. Johnny Depp? Yeah. Oh, yeah. there you go. <laughs> Excellent. Well, before we begin, um, we are going to be talking about roles in California and their long journey home. And to help inspire you, I know some of you have some coffee to wake you up a little bit, because some of you have been eating, um, thought we'd uh, start out with uh, the voices from the wolves themselves. down in Julian. and we'll talk about them a little bit more later. All right, so anyways, now that you feel so inspired, let's learn a little bit about wolves. We're going to talk a little bit about wolves. We've got the gray wolf, Canis lupus, lupus meaning gray, and the red wolf, Canis rufus, rufus meaning red. And for today, we're going to be focusing mostly on the gray wolf, which is the most common wolf in North America, the one to the left. Historically, before we came along, wolves were all over the United States the lower 48s. Pretty much every colored state there, the gray, the blue, and the red, um, had wolves in them. Uh, there virtually wasn't any state other than Hawaii that was free of wolves. We had historically the North American gray wolf in the areas colored with gray. In the blue areas just below there, historically lived the subspecies of this gray wolf, a very rare type of subspecies known as the Mexican gray wolf. We'll be talking a little bit more about him later. And then in the red is where that other species of wolf has historically lived, and that is where the red wolf was. We don't know exactly how many wolves there were historically, but we believe they were in the millions. So if there were so many wolves at one time, where did they all go? What happened to them? Well, there were several things that led to the demise of wolves over time. One of it simply had to do with population growth. Unlike the coyote, wolves do not do well in their urban lifestyle. They are very shy of anything new. They're very shy of humans. They're very fearful of anything industrial. For example, in Yellowstone National Park, a lot of the wolf packs are divided by the roads that go through the park because wolves don't like to cross those roads. Pretty interesting. So they did lose a lot of their natural habitat and they didn't like to be around humans um, as much as coyotes did. So population growth had a lot to do with losing the wolf off the landscape. Another issue was conflict with human activities. Even though wolves aren't responsible for as much of livestock degradation as we often read about, it's still a concern, right? I mean, nobody wants part of their livelihood <laughs> being taken down by a predator. And so conflict with human activities became an issue. But really, the number one thing that led to the demise of wolves in our country didn't have to do with these things. It actually had to do with this. Fairy tales and misconceptions of the big bad wolf. 
If you look at these stories, who's the bad guy? It's always the wolf, right? We all grow up with these stories, right? Three Little Pig, Little Red Riding Hood, The Werewolf, every scary Hollywood movie, you hear the wolf howling in the background, Halloween comes around, and you see the hear these you know, wolf howling tapes that you know people playing at their houses for the trick-or-treaters. So the wolf is constantly being portrayed as this scary, evil creature. And the Europeans brought this over with them, and because of these misconceptions of the wolves and the fears, the unfounded fears behind this animal, the conflict with human activities and population growth that conflicted with wolves themselves, the evidence like a skull or a pelt, and they could be shot, you could trap them, or you could use this deadly poison called Compound 1080. And fortunately, Compound 1080 is illegal today uh, because it didn't just devastate the wolves. Um, what they would do is they would lace carcass with this poison and leave it out. But wolves are the only ones to eat that. You had your scavengers as well, right? And because this poison acted systemically, it would stay in the system of a deceased animal, and whatever came to eat the animal, it came to eat the carcass, would also be poisoned. And so it was quite devastating, environmentally speaking. So where are the wolves now in the lower 48 states? Well, remember that map I showed you that was filled in virtually every state in our nation? Doesn't quite look like that today. Um, there's a lot of states that do not have wolves, but this isn't nearly as bad as it would have been about 20 years ago. About 20 years ago, you may have had a little bit of color up there by Minnesota in the Great Lakes area. But thanks to conservation efforts um, from organizations like the California Wolf Center and Defenders of Wildlife and others, and the new awareness about wolves, they were able to make a slow and steady comeback. And we're going to talk a little bit about, more about that uh, later. So there's about 4,100 wolves in the Great Lakes area. In the Yellowstone region, and all up in there, it's about 1,600 wolves. And then down in the blue area with the Mexican gray uh, wolves, there's about 83 to 85 currently in the wild. And uh, those guys are still struggling a bit. I'm going to uh, talk about them. And then there's about 100 red wolves um, in the wild there uh, left. So not a whole lot, comparatively speaking. So, kind of going back to my original question, I mean, why, why should we care about wolves? Why, with everything going on in this world, um, should we take the effort, the time, the resources to help this one animal recover? And that's an important question that we have to be able to answer. And there's a lot of answers that we often get. For some people, it's just the fact that they're beautiful, magnificent animals. Others, it's for the reasons of being persecuted and uh, our obligation to help return them. And for most people, it has to do with this. The fact that wolves play a vital, not just an important, but a critical ecological role. Wolves are pretty much at the center of the ecosystem in which they belong. And the other animals, and even the habitat, can often be dependent on having that top predator there. And one of the reasons this is the case for the wolf has to do with the prey that they eat. Wolves are one of the only top predators that go after such large prey, like the bison, the moose, the elk, and the caribou. And that is a very important role that these guys do. Um, as a result of their prey base, they are considered engineers of biodiversity. They're what we know as keystone species. Um, I know a lot of you have heard that term before, but that actually comes from the keystone arch. How many of you have heard of the keystone arch? That analogy. A lot of you have. So basically, a big stone arch, and the idea is you can take out any stone, and the arch won't come collapse. But you take out the keystone, and then the whole arch collapses. And so it's the same idea with the wolf. As a keystone species, you remove them from the habitat the ecosystem which they belong, and it can cause havoc on the rest of that particular ecosystem. They are a top predator, an apex predator, so nothing hunts the wolf other than humans. <laughs> um, they are what we call selective hunters. I mean, if you take a look, go back here, take a look at the prey that they go after, right? Um, not really easy prey, all right? There's sharp hooves, powerful horns, and wolves are only successful maybe 20% of the time they go hunting. And wolves can get injured and even killed during the hunt. So do you think they're going after the strongest and healthiest animals? No, all right? <laughs> Basic law of nature, right? They're going after the sick, the weak, the genetically inferior. 
um, wolves have such a sensitive uh, nose that they actually believe that they can smell a tooth infection in one of these large ungulates, hoofed animals. So what they do is they remove these animals, the diseased animals, and it helps keep these herds stronger and healthier. Okay, so they actually cull the herds, which is a very important part of uh, their job. Which leads us into the Yellowstone story. Yellowstone was a great example of what we mean by keystone species. There's a little bit of a controversy around that, just to how far the effect bulls really do have. But most scientists agree that they did, did play and do play a significant role um, in Yellowstone when it comes to what we call trophic cascades. So I'm going to kind of share with you a very simplified <laughs> uh, version of how that works and what we saw in Yellowstone. Before wolves were returned, scientists knew the Yellowstone was having issues. I mean, everybody thinks of Yellowstone as being this perfect, pristine, beautiful, you know, ecosystem, right? Um, but it wasn't that healthy, at least not as healthy as it could have been. And they were pretty sure it had to do with the fact that it was missing its top predator. And this is why. So you don't have a top predator, and you've got these large hooked animals, these ungulates, and there's nothing hunting them and nothing keeping them on the move. So the populations grow tremendously, right? Um, but then disease in the park began to rise as well. And nothing was chasing them. So they would just kind of hang out in favorite spots, mostly along stream beds, and they're grazing and grazing and grazing and keeping the foliage down, which caused a lot of erosion. A lot of erosion led to rushing water, which ruined a lot of the habitat for many of the fish species. Some of the willow and aspen weren't able to grow to maturity enough to support the beavers in making their dams, so they began to suffer and disappear from the park. The coyote came in as a top predator because there was nothing keeping him in his place. So then the fox suffered, and then the bear and the eagle were also um, starting to suffer as well as other animals. So they returned the wolf, and within seven years they started to see some changes. And nearly 20 years later now, they've seen significant changes. And again, here, simplify, <laughs> mind you, is how it works. You return the wolf, and the wolf starts to go after its natural, uh, natural prey, the large ungulates. Yes, the uh, size of the herds do diminish. However, disease goes down in the park as well. And because the wolf is now chasing these guys, hunting them, they're keeping them on the move. So they can't overgraze in one area. The foliage can start to grow, the stream beds clear up, aspen and, and um, willow begin to grow, the beaver is now brought back into the park and it begins to thrive because it has what it needs to make its dams and to create ecosystems 